This video is a compilation of the Supervisory Development course materials on feedback and coaching. Learn about the best practices on the topic of feedback and coaching in 30 minutes or less. Let's start with a couple of reasons why feedback and coaching are so helpful for us as supervisors. For your department or team to be successful, you need a high level of commitment and dedication to doing good work, plus an effective environment that provides the support and resources needed to get the work done. At the university, most people are highly committed and dedicated. However, when highly committed and dedicated people don't have an effective work environment, this leads to frustration. And based on uh, the university's engagement survey, about one in five faculty and staff are frustrated. Now, research shows that frustrated employees will do one of three things if the sources of frustration aren't addressed. First, they may find innovative ways to fix the sources of frustration and then become engaged, and that's wonderful. A lot of people don't do that. Another option is they may get tired of dealing with this frustration and look for other opportunities, often in another organization. Or three, they may lower their expectations and become disengaged. So reducing frustration is an important part of retaining talented employees and preventing disengagement, which harms morale and productivity. The reason I'm bringing this up is because one of the biggest sources of frustration at the university is not receiving coaching for development. When we looked at the 2017 employee engagement survey data, the item that asks about coaching and development had one of the biggest gaps between frustrated and engaged employees for both faculty and staff. So focusing on improving feedback and coaching is one of your best ways to boost engagement, reduce frustration, and retain your most committed and dedicated employees. Another reason to improve feedback and coaching skills is that they make performance management much easier and more effective. Traditionally, performance management has not been about feedback and coaching, but has been about setting goals at the beginning of the year and then doing performance reviews at the end of the year, two administrative processes that can take a lot of time and often do little to support development and performance. However, when the focus is more about regular feedback and coaching through ongoing check-ins, this does much more to support development and improve performance. Plus, it makes the performance review process much smoother. Effective feedback and coaching are very powerful drivers of performance and retention. So how do you make your feedback and coaching effective? The first step is to be sure that you are intentionally focusing your feedback where it is needed most. And that's our first topic for today. It falls in line with assessing performance, potential, and readiness. In order for your feedback and coaching to be focused where it is needed most, it's very important to distinguish between three foundational concepts, performance, potential, and readiness. As supervisors, it can be very easy to mix these up, but when we do, our efforts to support someone's development simply won't work, resulting in frustration for everyone. We're all familiar with the term performance, a word we hear at least once a year, hopefully more than that, um, but what is performance? Well, Performance refers to a person's effectiveness in achieving the goals and meeting the expectations of their current role. For most roles, two important indicators of performance are results and behaviors. These are often referred to as the what and the how of performance. So typically, when we think about performance, we think about things like delivers results on time or delivers quality work. The how is often harder to measure and therefore is often overlooked but how someone achieves their goals and delivers results is an important part of their performance. It also has a big impact on their ability to reach their goals in the future. Take Sarah, for example. Sarah is an educational technologist and has been in her role for two years. Over the course of the last two years, Sarah has consistently met all of her goals and objectives, which involve providing support to faculty in her college in designing, improving, and updating course websites and helping them to use new academic tools and methods. In addition to delivering strong results, Sarah also works well with her colleagues and productively resolves disagreements with others. So Sarah is someone who demonstrates both indicators of performance. She gets results, which is the what of performance, and she does so in an effective way. This is the how of performance. The second foundational concept is potential. Potential refers to a person's capacity to eventually develop the skills needed for a larger role. A very common mistake is to confuse performance and potential. Many supervisors do this, it's, it's easy to do. But they're not the same thing. 
Research has found that in many organizations, at most 30% of top performers also have the potential to succeed in a larger role. In other words, past performance may not be a good indicator that someone can succeed with more complex work. Now let's turn back to Sarah. In addition to high performance in her day-to-day -day work, Sarah has also come up with creative ideas for how her college might use a new tool to improve the student experience of navigating course websites. Sarah's ideas are being explored by her supervisor and a group of faculty interested in trying the new tool. Sarah asks to be part of designing and implementing the pilot. When something goes wrong, Sarah is quick to focus on how to resolve the problem, no matter how difficult that may be. She reflects on her mistakes and learns from them. So Sarah demonstrates many of the indicators of potential. She has the ability to solve complex problems, she's persistent, she's motivated, and she improves based on feedback. In other words, Sarah will likely increase her skills over time, possibly to the point where she will be ready for a larger role at some point in the future. Finally, the third foundational concept is readiness. Readiness refers to the degree to which someone has already acquired the skills, knowledge, and abilities needed for a new role. Someone who is ready for a new role has already developed the skills for that role. Readiness is what you assess when deciding whether to hire or promote someone or who to put in charge of a new project. Our colleague Sarah has performed well in her job as an educational technologist and shows signs of potential to increase her skills. So what about her level of readiness? Well, let's fast forward three years. With support and guidance from her supervisor, Sarah has now increased her skills and is seen as a leader among her peers and a trusted colleague to the faculty in her college. The university recently began planning for the implementation of a new learning management system, and Sarah's college needs someone to lead this effort within the college. So the question is, is Sarah ready to take on this role? Does she have the skills that she needs? It sounds like it. If you can distinguish between performance, potential, and readiness, your feedback and coaching will be focused where it is needed most, and everyone will be more engaged and productive. Your next step is to apply these tools. To help you do this, we created a simple two-page handout that guides you through how to provide effective feedback and coaching tailored to the individual's current level of performance and potential. So to sum up this section, performance refers to a person's effectiveness in achieving the goals and meeting the expectations in their current role. Potential is their capacity to eventually develop the skills needed for a larger role and readiness is whether they have the skills, knowledge, and abilities needed for a new role or more complex assignment. Approaching feedback and coaching from this angle may be new for many of you, so we created a few other resources to help you get familiar with the concepts and more importantly, to practice them. So feedback is information communicated for the purpose of helping another person modify their behavior to improve learning and performance. So an easy way to think about it is in three steps. Get ready, get set, give feedback. You may have heard the statistic that two thirds of feedback fails. And that's usually because the get ready and get set steps are ignored. So being proactive about giving feedback can help alleviate having to be reactive and deal with feedback that doesn't go well or escalates into performance issues. We have a quick guide, Get Ready, Get Set, Give Feedback on this if you weren't already aware, and you can access it from the Z-Link on the screen or in Module 1 of the Supervisory Development course. So I just want to review the Get Ready step first. So what you want to ask yourself is, do you take the time to prepare to give feedback? When you get ready, it's about laying the groundwork and being intentional and thinking first about your biases. Which means, do you have a higher standard for one employee in comparison with another? Does one employee get a pass because you've worked with them for a long time? What are the possible explanations for why someone is behaving in a certain way? Is a good question to ask as well. And these are just a few examples of common biases. And doing this will help you to be more objective and then increase the chances that your feedback will be effective, heard and understood. So then you want to think about how and where the feedback will occur and consider what the person needs for the conversation to be comfortable. 
And when people feel safe, they will be open and honest and more likely to hear what you have to say. So a lot of feedback or questions that we received after last year's webinar was how to deal with a direct report who's defensive about feedback and coaching. And sometimes defensiveness can come from workplace culture. And what I mean by this is, do team members feel that they can express their views, raise questions or concerns, and be open and honest with each other without fearing ridicule or disrespect? Or are people reluctant to admit their mistakes or to admit when they don't know something? That might be where defensiveness comes from. It's also beneficial to acknowledge that as a supervisor, you make mistakes too and you don't have all the answers. So tell your team that you might miss something and that they need to speak up and make you aware. This will put people at ease to talk about their mistakes more openly and to admit when they don't know something. Another word for this is psychological safety. And we have a lot more information on a quick guide called Establishing Norms and Expectations. And that can be found in the module for leading teams. We also have a link up there on the slide. So I want to get back to addressing your feedback pain points or fears about how someone might react. So you want to think about how might the person respond? So if you find yourself needing to give constructive feedback, think about your talking points and then brainstorm all the possible what if scenarios of how the person could respond such as what if they get angry? What if they cry? What if they say, well, you never told me that? And then devise a way to respond to each. And doing this can help keep your own emotions in check and keep you objective in the moment. So I wanna talk about the reaction of crying, for example. Tears are actually a biological reaction to stress and they indicate that there's a problem to assess. So you definitely want to acknowledge tears and not judge them. Offer the person a tissue so that they can gather their thoughts. This also shows them that you're paying attention. And then allow them room to process the information, but be supportive at the same time. And once the emotion has subsided, ask them a few questions like, what's wrong? What's going on? Or is there anything else that you want to tell me? You don't need to be a therapist. You just need to be available and supportive. You may find out that the person is overworked, sick or frustrated, and through the conversation, you can help address any underlying issues and move forward with clarity. So then, once you've had some time to get ready, you might feel like you're ready to give the feedback, but then before you do, make sure that it's a good time. If someone's in the middle of solving a problem or is trying to figure something out, you'll want to wait. Otherwise, it's just an interruption and distraction, which can cause more frustration. However, you don't want to wait too long, so it's about timing, but you want to time it right. So when you get ready and get set, it'll make giving feedback that much easier, which leads us to actually giving the feedback. So the best way to be objective is to formulate feedback through the Situation, Behavior, and Impact, or SBI, method, and always connect feedback to their goals. So next, Brandon and I are going to demonstrate examples of good and bad feedback so I want you to listen to our exchanges and for the SBI method and think about what's effective and what's not. In this scenario, Amanda is Brandon's supervisor and she needs to give him some constructive feedback about his actions in a team meeting this morning, but she doesn't want to sound too critical. So let's listen in. Hey Brandon, can I talk to you for a minute? Sure, what's up? You did a really nice job facilitating the team brainstorming meeting this morning. Hey, that's great. I thought it went okay. I spent a ton of time preparing. Oh, and uh, I also, um, I have something else I want to tell you. Okay. Well, I wanted to point out that you didn't do a very good job of listening to what other people on the team had to say. And you kind of made up your mind about what you wanted to do and then tried to make everyone agree with you. Does that make sense? Well, sometimes it seems like no one else on the team has an opinion about anything. Or if they do, they don't speak up. So that's why I offer my ideas to move forward. Oh, I get that. And at the same time, one thing I really appreciate about you is that you aren't shy about saying what you think. I really like that. Oh, okay. Thanks. So Brandon walks away from the conversation feeling confused and annoyed that Amanda's feedback, and Amanda walks away thinking the conversation went well. She felt relieved to get through the hard messaging by giving Brandon some positive feedback, too. 
Although this exchange seemed to go well, this is an example of a feedback sandwich in which constructive feedback is sandwiched between positive feedback. We talked about this in last year's webinar, and many people have asked about it since. It's tempting to use because it seems to soften the blow of constructive feedback, but instead it's just undermining your feedback and your relationship with your direct report who may discount the positive feedback, thinking it's not genuine. So we're going to run through that scenario again, avoiding the feedback sandwich. See if you hear the difference. Hey, Brandon, can I talk to you for a minute? Sure, what's up? I want to talk to you about your presentation this morning. Okay, I thought it was pretty productive. Well, a couple times you cut off both Mary and Ryan in mid-sentence to disagree with them. They hadn't even had the chance to finish explaining their ideas before you jumped in with a bunch of reasons why you didn't think their ideas would work. That also shut down what was supposed to be a brainstorming session so we could generate some ideas as a team. Uh, you know, I don't remember cutting them off. I do remember that Mary seemed pretty quiet in the meeting and Ryan seemed just really distracted with something. I don't think I had anything to do with that. Well, at the beginning of the meeting, we went around the table and everyone shared one idea they had for solving the problem. When it was Mary's turn, she started talking about her idea, and she was mid-sentence. But her idea would never work. You just did it again. Did you notice that? Just as I was talking, you cut me off to disagree with me. That's what I'm talking about, and the same thing that happened this morning. Oh, sorry about that. I guess I get so caught up in what I want to say, I just want to say it. Well, and that makes other people feel like you don't value or respect them, and that shuts down productive discussions. All right. So I should just stop speaking up then? Absolutely not. What I want you to take from this conversation is to be more self-aware of the impact that you're having on others. So next time, find a way of expressing your thoughts while also listening to what others have to say. So let's talk a little bit more about that now. So were you able to hear the difference? Amanda provided feedback using situation behavior impact method, which allowed her to be more objective and she didn't soften soften the message with positive feedback. Again, doing so just dilutes the message. Take note that feedback is not a one-time and you're done occurrence. It's easy to fall in the trap of, well, I tried this technique and it didn't work, so I'm giving up. Instead, Amanda may need to follow up a few times and continue to coach Brandon on developing reflective listening skills and address his defensive behavior. Feedback is not all or nothing. It's a continuum where Amanda may just have to continue to give Brandon repeated feedback before he develops enough self-awareness to change his behavior. Feedback doesn't always have to be critical or constructive, and it shouldn't be. You want to also catch people doing things right, but in a way that's valuable to the other person and not watered down. So here's another example. Amanda wants to praise Brandon for some exceptional work he's been doing lately, so she stops by his desk. Hey Brandon, the way you presented the data in the meeting this morning was terrific. Nice job. Well, thanks. I'm glad you thought it was good. I was a little nervous about the presentation. What do you think worked well? Oh, I don't know. You're just so good with data. Just keep up the good work. So Brandon leaves the meeting wondering what he did that was so good. He knows his supervisor thinks he did a good job, but doesn't know why. While it's great that Amanda gave Brandon positive feedback, it became watered down and won't mean as much in the long run. The purpose of positive feedback is recognition, but also to reinforce behaviors to continue doing. He won't know what to continue if he doesn't specifically know what he's doing right. He might think that feedback was about the way he assembled the data report, but in actuality, Amanda was praising him about his ability to answer questions about the data. So let's have Amanda try that again and listen for the difference. Brandon, that report you wrote and the way you presented the data this morning were terrific. What made your presentation so helpful was that you started by summarizing the key points in a way that everyone could understand, and it wasn't super technical. And then you also paid attention and stopped to explain things when people look confused. Nice job. Oh, well, thanks. I'm glad you thought it was good. I, I was a little nervous about the presentation. So here, Amanda used the SBI method to give her positive feedback, and Brandon now knows specifically what he did that was effective. So I'm going to just wrap up our section on feedback and transition to coaching because coaching and feedback are like peanut butter and jelly. But remember with feedback, try using the get ready, get set, and give feedback steps, especially formulating feedback with the situation, behavior, and impact approach. And this will allow you to describe the feedback in a way that's objective for the other person. 
So once you give feedback, it's all about coaching. Coaching is equipping people with the tools, knowledge, and opportunities they need to develop themselves and become more effective. Coaching is all about holding someone accountable to the feedback that they've received. So earlier, Brandon talked about the difference between engaged and frustrated employees. And the game changer is whether or not their supervisor takes the time to help their direct reports problem solve. And we're not saying to give them all the answers, rather teach them to fish, as the saying goes. If you're helping them solve problems by giving them all the answers, they're going to become dependent on you. So instead, share your ideas and suggestions. For example, you could help direct reports think through a situation they're facing and encourage them to brainstorm possible ways to solve the problem. That's coaching in action, and that should alleviate frustration and help foster engagement. Coaching is also a two-way street. So when you're coaching, are your employees taking ownership of their own career and development? Are they setting goals, seeking opportunities, and asking for guidance when needed? Are they asking questions about your expectations and goals? Are they proactive when work seems misaligned with broader goals and asking questions about that? Do they ask for feedback and once received, act on it? As a supervisor, are you communicating vision and strategy and clarifying their role in the big picture? Do you provide clear expectations for results, which is the what, and behaviors, the how of their work? Are you defining what success looks like? And revisiting goals and expectations during check-ins. So if you don't have these expectations established, feedback and coaching is not going to work very well. So first, you want to be sure to build this understanding into your conversations and relationships with your direct reports. So next, Brandon is going to talk more about how you can become a better coach. So just like the theme of this web webinar, coaching takes practice. And if you're thinking, like many of us do, that's great, but I don't have time, um, you're not alone. There's no way around the fact, though, that coaching does take time and energy. The good news is that if you focus your coaching in the right way, it doesn't take that much time to make a real difference. Another common challenge is when someone responds to feedback or coaching by arguing, getting defensive, or simply not seeming to care. Or someone may seem to accept your feedback and coaching in the moment, but then nothing changes, and it's as though you never had the conversation in the first place. When any of these things happen, the first thing to do is assess what is causing this. Consider whether you are delivering effective feedback are you describing the situation, behaviors, and impact? Are you being direct and clear? If not, then improving your feedback giving skills would be helpful. If you are doing all of these things and the person still isn't listening or responding to your feedback, then the issue is probably a lack of self-awareness, low motivation to change, or both. Here's the coaching process again. Notice that it begins with self-awareness and motivation to learn. Because a lack of self-awareness and motivation are two of the most common reasons coaching isn't successful, you'll want to assess these first. People who demonstrate self-awareness know their strengths, development opportunities, and can have open and honest conversations about them. If an employee seems defensive or doesn't respond to your feedback and coaching, consider, do they actually know what their strengths are? Do they know what their needs are? For example, do you have a direct report who constantly interrupts people when they're talking? Have they been given feedback about this behavior and the impact it has on others? Have they received this feedback more than once? To give them the benefit of the doubt, they may not be aware that they're doing these things. And even if they do, they may not fully appreciate how big of an impact it's having. So helping them understand the negative impact on others is a place to start. By the way, this applies to both strengths and development needs. Many people aren't aware of what they're doing well. In fact, some of the most talented people can also be the most critical of their own skills and accomplishments. So be sure to give plenty of feedback about strengths as well as development needs. Developing your own supervisory skills requires the same self-awareness and motivation you need from your direct reports. So don't forget that you'll be going through a parallel process yourself. Be sure to challenge yourself. Are you fully aware of your own strengths and development needs? Do you know the impact, positive, negative, and otherwise, that your behaviors have on others. Do you have blind spots where you might not be quite as effective as you think you are? We all have those. Are you motivated to make your supervisory skills a priority? The best way to develop self-awareness is to seek out feedback and then really listen to what others are telling you. 
If someone has self-awareness and knows that they, what they need to work on, but they are not putting much time or energy into it, then there may be a lack of motivation to change. If the person isn't motivated, then you'll find yourself giving the same feedback and coaching over and over, but there will be little to show for it. In this case, the key is to try to understand why the person doesn't see the point of taking action to learn and improve. Then, the person, then help the person see what's in it for them if they do put time and effort into it. By our nature, people strive for purpose and meaning in our lives, including at work. But different people are motivated by different things, which fall into one or more of the goals listed on this slide. Consider, what is your primary source of motivation? If someone seems unmotivated, consider which of these may be the most meaningful to them, and try to help them see how your feedback and coaching can help them achieve their goals. Are they looking for stronger connections with others, influencing others, having more autonomy, demonstrating their skills and expertise? Keep in mind that other people may have very different sources of motivation than you do. Finally, discuss and agree on the next steps for the work for the person's development and for your check-ins. This can be simple or highly detailed, and it can be formal or informal. The key is to just do it. Consider what makes the most sense for the work and for the individual, and ultimately for you. At a minimum, discuss and agree on what are the person's next steps and what are your next steps, and when will you complete them? So I'm just gonna summarize the coaching section. Remember that a person always needs self-awareness and motivation to learn from coaching. Because if they don't, you want to first work with them to build up those areas. And one of the biggest coaching decisions is deciding exactly what skills, knowledge, and abilities to focus on and picking appropriate tools to then help the person develop through ongoing feedback, support, and practice. And once you know what will work for the person, then you continue to help them be successful in that area. So just remember that coaching for development and the reason we do it is all about retaining motivated, talented, and skilled people. And earlier in the presentation, Brandon mentioned how feedback and coaching tie into performance management. So as long as you continue to have check-ins that include effective feedback and coaching, by the time you get to that formal evaluation, it should really be a simple summary of all the conversations that you've already had. And you can start this process right now, no matter if you're nearing the end of performance reviews or have already finished them, just start practicing today and make that a habit. If you want to learn more about feedback and coaching or watch a full version of the on-demand webinars, navigate to the Supervisory Development course website at supervising.umn.edu. Under the A to Z course materials tab, you'll find quick videos, full webinars, podcasts, and guides on this topic. Under modules, you can find a self-paced feedback and coaching module that includes more resources such as knowledge check quizzes, answers to most commonly asked questions around feedback and coaching, and in-depth articles and resources. Thank you for watching.